Dean, you're muted. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> okay, welcome everyone. A couple of notes on accessibility. You can find a link to the Access Live transcription for this event directly under the video on the BCRW event page or in the YouTube video description. Thank you to Rebecca from Total Caption for providing the live transcription. Thank you to our ASL interpreters for tonight's event, Gregorio and Nora from Body Language Productions. We're planning for the event to take place for one and a half hours, ending at 8.30 p.m. Eastern time. We'll start tonight's event by hearing from each of our speakers, followed by a conversation. After the conversation, we'll have time for Q&A. So if you have questions, you can ask them in the chat on the YouTube Live page or by tweeting BCRW tweets or emailing BCRW at barnard.edu. Many thanks to BCRW student research assistant, Kayla Legrand, who is working with Eve tonight behind the scenes. And many thanks to Eve and Hope who've done so much organizing to make this event happen. I'm sure many of you know that BCRW puts on many incredible events and has a wonderful website full of videos and resources. I wanted to mention that the Scholar and the Feminist Conference on Art and Political Imagination is upcoming. And there's also soon to be an event marking the one year anniversary of the publication of Beyond Survival, a really incredible um, new anthology about transformative justice. Um, so we hope you will attend those. More details will be coming up soon on BCRW's website. Tonight I am um, presenting our primary speaker, Mike Haber. Mike is a clinical professor of law and directs the Community and Economic Development Clinic at the Hofstra Law School. The clinic provides legal assistance to community-based organizations, social movement groups, and cooperatives, collectives, and social enterprises. Mike's scholarship focuses on the intersection between community institution building, social movements, and nonprofit law. Mike is also the author of a really useful paper that's free online that talks about legal issues that face mutual aid groups. I think someone's gonna put the link in the chat right now. We're also gonna be joined for two of our questions during a later part of the event by a tax ex expert, Robert Caserta, who is a visiting assistant clinical professor of law at, the, at Hofstra University. I wanna mention before we dive in um, that there's a resource list on the event page for this event. Someone will put a link in the chat um, that has a lot of resources we thought might be useful for people coming to this event. So hopefully you'll check that out. Um, I also wanted to share that inevitably we're not going to get to every question that people are bringing to this event tonight. And so what we are going to encourage people to do is email questions after the event to bcrw at barner.edu. And we're going to give those questions to Mike and Robert and other people who might be able to help answer them and then post answers that hopefully will be useful to many people. Um, so that email address should be in the chat now. Today, we're gonna to focus a lot on questions that people put in when they registered for the event. And then we're also gonna have some time for live Q&A after we address some of those questions. One other resource that we're going to make available um, for all that we can't get to tonight um, is that there's been a, a COVID-19 mutual aid Slack channel active in, um, the US um, over the last year. We've gotten permission to add people who want to join that to that Slack so that people can see the resources that are already there about these questions and also have further conversations and share information. So that'll be another thing you can email BCRW about if you wanna be added. I wanna say also just generally about some of the limitations of this session tonight. Um, not only is it short, so we will only get to certain amounts of topics and there's so many detailed um, issues people are facing, but also generally the system we're talking about tonight is designed to make it hard for people to do mutual aid. 
And so we don't have any magic bullet answers. We're not here to tell people that everyone should try to follow the rules. We just want people to know what the rules are so that groups can make strategic choices about what risks to take and what costs and benefits different approaches might have. We're not endorsing this system of rules. We're just trying to help people demystify it and so that people can make the best guesses about the next actions. I also wanna say this event is different than many events that we do with BCRW. We're getting into, into the weeds of some really dry stuff. And I think that's important because many people need that information right now. But I just wanted to, to say that transparently. This event is less about our biggest level analysis of the systems and more about some specific things we might need to do right now to kind of get by in these systems and continue our mutual aid work. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mike, who's gonna make a presentation um, for about 30 minutes. Then we're gonna go through some of the questions that came in ahead of the event, and then we'll move to live Q&A. Thank you so much for being here with us. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for, um, for hosting this. I wanna thank uh, Barnard Center for Research on Women and Dean for promoting this. And, um, you know, it seems like there's a great turnout. I know that there's a lot of interest in these issues. Um, my email is full of, of people for the last few months asking these kinds of questions. And um, they're important questions. And so I'm, I'm happy to uh, be here to try to, you know, shed light where I can and to at least explain what the questions are where I don't have a, a clear and concise answer. So I'm going to share my presentation here. Okay. So um, at the Hofstra Law School Community Economic Development Clinic, we represent uh, activist groups, both sort of semi-large groups that are um, doing you know, progressive organizing and what folks who are on the more radical direct action um, activist left, that is sort of the, the tradition that, that I come out of and I think a lot of um, folks doing mutual aid now come out of. So I wanna start my presentation with a disclaimer. I am a lawyer after all. The, the law here isn't black and white and I can't speak to the law in every state or to the specific situations of all other groups. And one of the things about mutual aid that's really cool is people are um, being experimental, trying different things, seeing what works for your community, your neighborhood. And um, that experimentation is, you know, awesome. It's what it's all about. At the same time, it um, makes having like a, here are the five answers you need to know, um, you know, hard. So this is intended as general information, not specific legal advice. Um, from what I've heard about the different groups um, online and, and in seeing the questions that people sent in, people are up to really incredible, inspiring stuff. And I'm so happy to uh, have a chance to, to meet with y'all today. And I'm also really excited for the Slack channel um, going forward as a place to share information. And, um, you know, I tend to believe that, that folks who are doing the work often have um, really good answers and really good experiences. And, and so there's some uh, sharing of information that will be just as important or more important than, than hearing from, you know, people who are, who are lawyers or law professors. So um, the second assumption and expectation I have going into this is, you know, I see mutual aid and I hope that all of you see some version of this as a political project. You know, we're not just buying groceries. We're right now trying to build the infrastructure for a new world, a world based on autonomy and horizontalism and free figurative politics. Um, as uh, John Holloway once wrote, um, not taking power and changing the world, but changing the world without taking power. So I see my work as at the intersection of some you know, in the weed stuff, as Dean said, corporate law, tax law, contract law, things like that. And the kinds of activist projects that, um, you know, folks are engaging in, in the mutual aid world. So um, 
I think it's important to know about this stuff for exactly the reasons that um, that Dean said. You know, we need to know about the rules, not because we love the rules, but because um, understanding the risks when we're doing this stuff is important. It's important to protecting our projects. It's important to protecting our communities. And it's important to making our mutual aid work not something that's around for a month, but something that can be, um, you know, a real foundation that we can build on for the future. So the bulk of my substantive presentation today is going to be um, talking about the five most common ways that mutual aid groups have been handling money, moving money. Uh, there are other models out there that people are using, but it seems to me like these are the, the five most common. The first is going through a single member's account, one member of your mutual aid group. So it might be through a bank account, it might be through Venmo or PayPal or Cash App, usually using what they call a personal profile or a personal account. There's the unincorporated association account where your group, you haven't been incorporated, but you do go through some of the hoops that are required by a bank or by a place like Venmo to get an account as an unincorporated association, um, usually called a business profile or a business account if you're using a place like Venmo or PayPal. The third approach is fiscal sponsorship. We'll talk about um, what that means in a little more detail when we get to, to that part of it. The fourth is through an incorporated entity, which might be an LLC or a cooperative or potentially a business corporation. I'm also going to put a nonprofit that doesn't have tax exemption in that same category. And then the last category are tax exempt organizations, 501c3s, 501c4s. There's 30 or so different categories of tax exemption, but but you know the two most popular for tax exempt organizations are usually 501c3 and 501c4. So the bulk of the initial presentation I'm going to give here is going to go through these different things and talk about some of the issues they face and some of the pros and cons of those different models. And then we're going to dig into um, the questions that were sent in ahead of time to get more information on some of these same issues and to dig further into some of the questions that um, people have, have brought to our attention that are specifically facing your groups. So the first model here is money coming through a single member's account. We see here um, in this picture, those little clip art circles are uh, dollars coming in from donors, coming in from members of your community, going into your account, you know, into one, one member's account, whether it's their bank account or their Venmo or their PayPal, and then being spent out, um, given out in direct cash, um, contributions to people who are in need in the community or in the form of groceries or other necessities that people might need. So, you know, there's a clear benefit of this approach. It's informal, it's quick, you can be up and running um, kind of right away. But there's some downsides. Uh, accountability is a real concern when money is going through a single member's account. You don't even have to imagine the worst case scenario of, you know, somebody just stealing money. But, uh, you know, lots of times people, you know, somebody who's, whose account you're using gets sick or they go out of town or, you know, they, they have other commitments and uh, there's, there's no real way to um, hold them accountable to keep your project going if you're kind of reliant on that one person. The second concern, um, and this is, you know, at least it seems to me like it's talked about less in mutual aid spaces than I'd like to see it talked about is you know, Venmo and PayPal and banks are, you know, not really our friends. And, um, you know, if they're, if we're saving money in those accounts and they're making five or 7% off of our funds, you know, that's, uh, you know, to, to me, that's not um, good politics. And so just on its own, using those places to hold our money is, um, is not a great situation. So the questions that come up in this single member model are the questions that have come up a lot. Uh, these are these are the questions that have gotten, you know, repeatedly in the last month or two, and I imagine I will continue to get uh, repeatedly in the, in the next month or two as people um, start thinking about their you know, potential taxes. So I'm going to go through a quick overview of this stuff, and then my colleague Robert Caserta is going to do a deeper dive into some of the nitty gritty when we get into the Q&A section. Um, the first issue that comes up when we're talking about this is the idea of gift taxes. 
you know, gift taxes are for the average mutual aid group, probably not a concern. You can give up to $15,000 to any one person. And so gift taxes are paid by the donor and the, the, the donor, if your mutual aid group is giving out money or your individual member is giving out money, they can give $15,000 to person one, $15,000 to person two, $15,000 to person three, and none of that um, raises any gift tax issues. Once you are exceeding $15,000 to any one person, then that excess counts against the gift tax um, cap and you do need to report that to the IRS, but there is an exception for something north of $11 million. So in your lifetime, um, if you're giving away more than $11 million worth of gifts, you um, are going to be subject to the gift tax. But for most mutual aid groups, you're not looking at numbers uh, anywhere near that. And even if you have one member who, you know, may be somebody who has a lot of resources, a lot of money, and they have, you know, other contributions they're planning on in their lifespan, um, you know, $11 million is still a big number. The second issue that comes up sometimes in this category is if you have people who are working as sort of independent contractors for your mutual aid group, if somebody is doing work and getting paid for that work for your group, um, they may be required to do a 1099 MISC form if they have over uh, $600 in, in payments going out. But specifically for, for people who are doing labor, doing work and getting paid for their, for their work. The third and most common issue is, you know, is there a tax on the individual who has money going through their, their Venmo or their PayPal or their bank account that then gets distributed for mutual aid? Um, and the related question of whether a person is going to uh, get a 1099-K, which is a particular tax form that might be sent by, um, what, especially by one of these payment uh, providers like, like Venmo or PayPal, and what happens so I'm going to go through some of this. And again, my friend uh, Robert is going to pick up from there. But you know, the first, the first piece of this is that gross income, this is taxable income under the Internal Revenue Code, is, is all income from whatever source derived. But there's an exception to that for gifts. Um, gifts is a technical legal term of art. And the term of art is defined as detached and disinterested generosity out of affection, respect, admiration, charity, or like impulses. The general idea here is that it's not an exchange. It's not because there's an expected benefit. It's not in return for some service. Many mutual aid activities seem to meet the definition of gifts, but not all. So this is going to be one where you're going to have to think about what exactly your activities are and, and whether or not they're going to meet that standard. The third thing here is that some of the payment processors might provide a Form 1099-K. Um, when, uh, when one of these places provides a 1099-K, they're sending a copy not just to you, but also to the IRS. So the IRS knows about this, um, this money. The default rule on 1099-Ks is that Venmo or, um, or any payment processor is required to send a 1099-K if two things. Number one, there's over $20,000 in gross payments. And number two, there's over 200 separate payments in a calendar year. A payment processor could choose to do one if they are uh, underneath that. But that seems unlikely because it's somewhat um, counter to their you know, business interests. Uh, no, no, you know, nobody's going to split their check at the end of the night using uh, using Venmo if they have to think about their taxes, right? So um, the bigger concern is that 1099ks um, for mutual aid groups that that are doing some transactions less than twenty thousand and less than two hundred. The bigger concern is that a lot of states have started to require 1099ks to be issued um, at much lower dollar amounts. So as little as $600 coming in, it, it varies a little bit from state to state. And so you need to pay attention to your states, but in at least nine states, um, payments of 600 or $1,000 can trigger that 1099K. So um, 
in, in my research, which has been limited so far, it looks like Vermont, Virginia, Massachusetts, DC, Jersey, Mississippi, Illinois, Maryland, Arkansas, Florida is coming next year, or I should say this year, 2021 for next year's taxes. States are trending in this direction. So um, 1099Ks might become more of a common thing. And it's important to pay attention to, to the 1099K if you get it. So the challenge for us is that so much of whether or not this is taxable has to do with you know, the intent of the, of the donor, of the person who's um, giving money to your mutual aid group. Was it intended to meet this disinterested generosity standard or for some other reason? So I just wanted to lay out that basic, those basic concepts now, and then I'm going to turn it over um, in the Q&A portion to my colleague, Robert, who's gonna dig deeper into those considerations but uh, this is an important issue that, uh, that a lot of groups are gonna be facing. And so I wanted to make sure to, to at least raise it here while we're talking about the different models. So that was the first model, the single members account. Model number two is money coming through an unincorporated association account. So here, same picture, individual people are contributing money. Here we have the group bank account Venmo, PayPal, usually using a business profile, and then paying out in the form of money or groceries or whatever it might be. The benefits of this approach, you know, it's free and pretty easy to get an employer identification number, an EIN, that's for banking purposes only on the IRS website. Uh, don't go to some other website that charges you, it's free on the IRS website to get one of these numbers. And that's usually a requirement of uh, opening a bank account. Your, indi you know, your, your individual bank, whether it's Venmo or PayPal or your local credit union or a big you know, Chase or Citibank, wherever you're, you're trying to deposit money, they're going to have some of their own rules and it's going to vary um, a little bit from place to place. But that piece of it, getting the EIN, you can do online and that's very straightforward. The second uh, benefit here is that some of that accountability question can go away. The group gets control over their money. So you can kind of set up procedures that merge the way that you make decisions with what the bank is requiring. So for instance, if your group makes decisions around money using consensus, you can say, we're gonna make decisions about using consensus and before the two people who have to sign at the bank, sign at the bank or, you know, press the button on the computer, press the button on the computer, they will have, you know, an official email that says, yes, we've, you know, can, you know, given consensus to the decision of whether we should give X dollars in, in X way. The third benefit is that if you want to be declared a 501c3, but you don't want to deal with the paperwork, and you don't have a lot of revenue, you can basically declare yourself a 501c3 without dealing with all the IRS paperwork. In order to do that, you have to um, ordinarily, it's the term of art, ordinarily receive less than $5,000 in revenue. Um, in your first year, you can actually get up to $7,500 in revenue and still count as ordinarily under $5,000. But, uh, you know, being 501c3 provides some incentive to some donors. And so uh, that might be a way to increase um, contributions to your project if that is something you're interested in. You still need to do record keeping at the end of the year, uh, what's called the 990N tax filing. So it's not totally painless, but it is you know, a potential advantage of this approach. The concerns, you know, the top concern here is that it is not always easy to find a bank or a credit union um, and even if you find one to deal with all of their many requirements, uh, they can be hard to, you know, some, it's often hard to find a bank or a credit union who will say yes to an unincorporated association. And in, in my experience, it's often the case that they're especially um, conservative and unwilling to work with groups that have, um, you know, political missions. They might also, even if they're willing to give you a bank account, um, require tons of paperwork, 
you know, almost as much as you would have to do if you went through a full incorporation process and drafted bylaws. Um, and in other cases, they'll require things that you might not want to do, like um, paying for insurance or other things that might just be not um, something that you want to care about doing. Um, there are some banks and credit unions out there that that do offer this. And, you know, I know Amalgamated Bank has held themselves out as doing this. And I think that that's, um, that's great. They're, they're a B Corp bank. Um, and uh, check your hometown credit union. You know, I know I live in Brooklyn, New York, and here Brooklyn Cooperative Credit Union has been doing some of these. And um, uh, your local credit unions may offer some banking services as well. And that's a great uh, sort of mission aligned fit in, in some cases at least. Questions, you know, because you're not incorporated, there's probably a greater risk. And uh, the other concern here, I'm sorry, is that you um, you still might get 1099K just as with the individual account, but it um, but it would be for the for the group. The question here, the question here is. Um, because you aren't incorporated, there's a greater risk than if you were incorporated that the IRS might look to your individual members if taxes aren't paid. Um, and so that's a potential source of concern. The third model that um, I think is quite a popular model in the mutual aid world right now is using a fiscal sponsor. So we have uh, again, the same money coming from donors, but it goes into the bank account of another entity, usually a 501c3 entity, and they have a contract with your mutual aid group where you agree to sort of comply with what they tell you that you have to do, jump through the hoops that they require of you, and then they pass the money along to you to spend um, as you've told them you've spent it. The advantage of that is that it really does save a lot of tax headaches because you are taking advantage of the fiscal sponsors 501c3 status. That's the reason to, to use this model without having to go through all of the paperwork of filing for 501c3 status or in many cases even incorporating. So as I said, the benefit avoids most tax concerns and the uncertainty around, you know, whether or not you're going to get uh, 990 and those kinds of uh, worries that lots of groups have. Uh, and again, because you have this uh, tax deductibility, that's um, potentially a real advantage if you want to, you know, have people who care about giving to a 501c3, which is usually, you know, richer people. And then, um, you know, potentially also could, could think about applying for grants or things like that, if that's something that you'd be interested in doing, which I know is not everybody's thing. The concern here is fiscal sponsors can be slow, they can be expensive, they can be hard to work with. Um, they often charge five to 10% of your money to just hold it for a little while and be a pain and then pass it along. Um, they are, uh, you know, they tend to be risk averse in a way that, that many mutual aid groups may not be. And so they might be more conservative on funding projects than you would want to be. They might say, oh, we're not really willing to do that because that's kind of pushing the boundaries of what we could do as a 501c3. And you might say, yeah, we want to push those boundaries. That is you know, precisely the limit of the fiscal sponsor. So the question, you know, a question that, that comes up and that I, that I have at least is, you know, is it better to use a fiscal sponsor or to sort of bite the bullet and go ahead and get 501c3 status if you hope to be around for a long time? Um, it's a judgment call. It's a judgment call. Um, and I know that um, lots of people on this call have an aversion to nonprofits and to the nonprofit industrial complex. And we're going to talk about that um, in a little bit. But I'm also sort of a, um, a DIY kind of person. And, uh, you know, having control over my own process and deciding when I'm going to, you know, comply with what the IRS wants me to do or not, rather than having a contract with somebody who's, you know, holding my money and preventing me from from using it if they're not happy with what I'm doing. Uh, 
you know, at the very least raises the question as to the, you know, whether the fiscal sponsor has a benefit over the 501c3 if you want to be, you know, around for more than a few months or a year. Okay. The fourth model is incorporating an entity to handle your money. So here we have money coming in. Again, it's going to your group bank account or Venmo or PayPal. But you take this step. You send a formal piece of paper, plus around 100 bucks, to your state. It can vary. Sometimes it's more than 100 bucks. In a few cases, it's a lot more than 100 bucks. But by and large, you're talking about you know something in that range and a formal piece of paper to the state to incorporate an entity. This is speaking generally about entities. You know, there's differences, of course, between LLCs and nonprofits and business corporations and cooperative corporations. Those are all different, and they all have differences from state to state as well. All the laws are a little bit different, at least from state to state. But um, this is the general idea here. So the benefits of this approach, um, again, having having a corporate entity allows you to create sort of group processes. And uh, if you have a corporation of some sort, there's probably some default processes that you have to that you have to follow. Um, and there are downsides to that, which we'll talk about in a second. But they do they do create some clear processes, and so that is a benefit. A second benefit is you directly handle your own money, which is different than the fiscal sponsor model. Third, um, having a corporation protects against liability for members. You know, lots of people, that's the one thing that, that we might know about corporations is that they provide limited liability. If somebody who uh, is affiliated with or part of a corporation um, takes some action, it's pretty hard to sue that individual. It's much easier to sue the entity, which may not have um, lots of money to recover against. Next, um, again, that that same benefit where if, if you're a small nonprofit, if you're incorporated as a nonprofit and you stay small under that $5,000 or really $7,500 first year in gross revenue, then you can operate as a 501c3 without dealing with paperwork. And then finally, if you're a nonprofit, if you incorporate as a nonprofit, uh, corporation in your state. Uh, you can kind of hold off on the decision about tax exemption for 27 months. You have a long time before you have to deal with it. There's some stuff you have to do in between, but if you get tax exemption within 27 months, it's retroactive to the time that you incorporated. So that's, you know, another potential benefit. Lots of concerns here. You know, the default rules of the corporation are incredibly hierarchical and really pretty rigid. You can vary from those rules, but that takes a lot of time and effort. Um, it's not necessarily the easiest thing to do, especially if you're trying to do the actual mutual aid work that is your focus. If you want to spend all your time debating changes to bylaws, that's fine, but you know that's going to take up a chunk of your time that you might not have. Second concern is you have to deal with the state. You have to disclose a you know, some information to it. Uh, I can appreciate both a desire to just say, no, I'm not going to deal with the state at all. And also um, a desire to, you know, not even give your name to the state. Uh, one of the things that often in many kinds of entities, not all, in many kinds of entities, you need to give some name to the state as the person who is incorporating or one of the directors of the entity. And, um, by and large, that's not a concern on the entity side, on the on the sort of government side that there's a name associated with something. There's not much history of states saying, oh, there's there's this name here. I'm concerned about that name. But then your name is public. And so if you have you know political enemies who are saying, you know, who's attached to this mutual aid group that's doing all this, you know, radical organizing in our community, well, your name is attached to it. And so you might have um, you know, you know, white nationalists or, or anybody like that who might be uh, concerned about your activities and find your name associated with it. 
other you know other concern you state might still owe tax just because you form an entity there's you know there's now corporate tax then the question here is what if you incorporate a nonprofit but you never file for tax exemption um you are still taxable as a corporate entity but um you have you have that 27 month window where you can kind of be um you know kind of kind of take advantage of that period of that window where you don't have to declare anything really okay our last model and sort of the most nonprofit industrial complex of all of our models is fully becoming a 501c3 or a 501c4 or some other kind of tax exempt organization again formal piece of paper plus 100 bucks you can actually become a tax exempt organization as an unincorporated association but it's, it's extremely rare and really pretty hard and the irs looks at you with a ton of scrutiny so um i would not encourage it unless you're you have a, a real commitment to that model you may have to take some other steps like adopting bylaws and then there's the application for tax exemption that gets sent to the irs uh the 1023 ez is a streamlined form if you're under fifty thousand dollars in total revenue you may qualify for that and that's a form that's pretty easy to do and not a huge lift the long form 1023 and the long form 1024 are longer applications so just in general terms a 501c3 is more likely to get grants but has more restrictions on it there are limits on your ability to do electoral work you know pushing for one candidate or another in an election and uh and that's uh sort of strictly limited uh prohibited in a 501c3 and then there's limits but much looser limits on lobbying on issues a lot of what mutually um folks might do and think of as politics does not fall under the definition of political activities of the irs you know um participating in you know movement for black lives demonstrations does not count as politics in the eyes of the irs or or does but in a very limited kind of way so um you can do a lot with with these exempt organizations, but um, but they do come with those restrictions, as well as other downsides that we'll talk about momentarily. 501c4 has a lot fewer restrictions than the C3, but it doesn't provide that benefit to donors. Donors don't get to take that tax deduction, although that the organization itself doesn't pay taxes in either of these models. So benefits. Um, all the benefits of incorporation plus donations to the group may be tax deductible for donors if they're a 501c3, so people might be more happy to give. Lots of concerns about these approaches, though. You know, again, the default rules will be hierarchical and rigid. There are ways to work around that, and that is what I do um, as a job <laughs> for much of for much of my day. But um, but the default rules are hierarchical, hierarchical and rigid and kind of hard to vary from without you know a lot of work. Um, some of those restrictions on 501c3 groups around political activities and lobbying may be troubling. The application itself is time consuming. You have to share information with the IRS in a public document. Again, the IRS um, is not allowed to and, and you know basically has a pretty good history of not sharing information with ICE and other um, groups like you know other governmental agencies like that but those documents are semi-public at least they're they're freedom of information act requestable and so uh anything that you put in those applications could be obtained by anybody uh there are annual compliance requirements which is again more paperwork more um more stuff more paper to pay attention to um and less time that you can spend on your work and i'm going to wrap up my presentation here by talking about the nonprofit industrial complex. So, um, you know, a lot of folks on this uh, program are probably familiar with the nonprofit industrial complex and the critiques of the nonprofit industrial complex. I think of these critiques as incredibly valid and valuable um, and important for us as activists. But I also think that um, there's a tendency to not fully 
digest all of those critiques. Um, there's a tendency, which I get, to uh, say, you know, oh, I used to work at a nonprofit and my boss is a jerk. Nonprofit industrial complex. Um, but then we assume that, you know, mutual aid groups would never have those same kinds of problems, those same kinds of issues. And so I think if we're going to take the critique of the nonprofit industrial complex seriously, we should also make sure that we're holding ourselves to the same standards. So um, to just give some of the, the big critiques of the nonprofit industrial complex, nonprofit hierarchy elevates people who are best educated and most privileged, preventing real leadership by the people with the most at stake. But let's make sure when we're doing our mutual aid that we're not being led, whether it's formally or informally, um, by the people in our in our communities. With uh, let's make sure that we are that we are being led by the people in our communities with the most at stake. Let's make sure that we're not putting up barriers to prevent those people from really playing meaningful roles in our work. Second, uh, nonprofits are often unwilling to take controversial or militant stances because it may hurt their ability to attract wealthy donors. Uh, we should make sure that we're not relying um, on rich people to fund our mutual aid, or if we are, that we're not limiting our public positions on, you know, things like racism or capitalism or gentrification or abolition, so that we, um, you know, offend these potential donors. Um, I think that that is uh, of critical importance, and you know, maybe maybe one of the most critical distinctions between. Uh, the nonprofit industrial complex and what we're trying to do with mutual aid. Third, the idea of movement capture. Nonprofits can leech off of social movements and suck out their funds, energy, and power. And let's make sure that um, we are not just devoting our time to keeping up with requests for, for food, but that we're clearly communicating and clearly connecting our survival programs to the broader movement for social change. And finally, tax exemption is a tool for the wealthy to minimize their taxes, not a tool to help the poor. But we should think about what our tools for moving, moving money are subsidizing. Um, federal tax exemption is prob politically problematic, but are we being equally critical of using big banks and PayPal? So that's my, um, that's my quick presentation here. A uh, little shout out to my colleagues here. And I'm going to uh, end there. Thanks so much, Mike. Um, I am just going to raise these questions that came in before, um, in advance of the event. Um, that we kind of collated the ones that we thought would be good to answer inside the um, the event. And I think that Robert is actually going to answer this one, but I'll read this question aloud that you all can see on your screen right now. My organization's PayPal, Cash App, and bank account are all linked to my personal identity. We have fully tracked all incoming and outgoing funds. Our accountant, who co-manages the fund, believes that there isn't a need to declare this as income because it isn't. The bank account for the organization is separate from my personal bank accounts. Is the best move not to declare these funds in any way on my tax return or am I obligated to do so? It's over $500,000 that has moved through the account since we started. What are factors that may lead to this money being determined as income if the IRS were to ever audit me since the cash apps and bank account are linked to my social security number and personal information. All right, so uh, as Mike said earlier, uh, the law on, on this subject is not totally clear. And so the advice I'm gonna give is not gonna be super specific. Um, I'm going to mainly speak uh, about this in with respect to an individual tax return and not a uh, organized um, um, entity because an organized entity like an LLC can be taxed a number of different ways. It can be taxed as an individual, it can be taxed as a corporation or as a partnership. So most of the, what I'm going to speak about, if there's anything specific to the tax return, is about the individual tax return. 
um, the idea of how I'm going to the information I'm going to give you is, is so you have enough uh, information to ask the right questions, essentially, um, if these issues come up. So the good thing is in this situation that there's a separate bank account. Uh, it is much easier to go back and show where money moved if it's all moving through a bank account separate than a, a, your personal bank account that you do your everyday banking with. Um, the what Mike mentioned earlier, you know, is that ta uh, gifts are not uh, taxable. Uh, in fact, there's not a place to report a gift on the regular individual tax return, the 1040. Um, I will speak about what would happen if you receive a 1099K in the next question. But so the basic idea is if the money's a gift, it's not taxable. Um, the recipient doesn't report the gift on the return. Uh, the, re the recipient of a gift is not tax on a gift if as we mentioned earlier only the donor the person who gave the gift is potentially has tax issues um just for transactions that i don't really think it affects the analysis much is the, the money you received could be looked at possibly as you received a gift and then gave a gift to someone else or you received a gift and you were kind of the the agent who um or the conduit of who gave it to the the final person um so what makes a gift a gift? As Mike mentioned earlier, gifts result from detached and disinterested generosity and often given out of affection, respect, admiration, charity, or like impulses. Um, the IRS hasn't, doesn't give much guidance on what that means. Uh, the IRS will address the facts and circumstances around each individual gift. Um, and that is how the IRS handles it and that's how all the courts handle it, um, deciding whether or not somebody has a gift. The IRS did release some guidance and this came out of in 2016. It's very minimal and it, and it has to do with based on crowdfunding and people receiving uh, money through the crowdfunding and give it, giving it to a third party, but it moves to their bank account. The They've said um, that amounts received are taxable if they aren't gifts made out of detached generosity and without quid pro quo. Uh, this is essentially the, the same definition that we gave. And the important thing there is as long as the donor is not receiving anything in return, most likely it is characterized as a gift. That's the most important part. Uh, and that's what we call donative intent. Um, so what may affect that? Uh, income being classified, or it's not income, what may affect that money being classified as a gift uh, or not uh, being classified as a gift. So, for example, I think that if your organization sends an email to somebody who donated to you uh, containing a newsletter that just says this is what we're doing generally with our money, I don't think that's enough that you're receiving that it would uh, affect the donor of intent or the status as a gift. Um, if your organization sends somebody, uh, you know, these are just pure examples, just as I can give most basic. If, if your organization gives somebody a watch because they donated $10,000, that may affect the donor of intent in, in f full or in part, meaning part of it may be considered uh, a gift and part of it may be considered income. Um, so if, if the main thing is if at, at the time the gift is given, the donor has an expectation that they will receive something in return, either immediately or at a later date, that would affect the donor of intent. Uh, the, um, so, and the, the thing is, and the idea is, and a lot of the litigation is around um, people trying to get creative with what uh, a, a transaction is, and there's something in IRS, um, in tax law litigation, and the IRS uses it as well, called the substance over form doctrine. And what that means is they look at the substance of the transaction and what happened, not what you call or label things. So just as a, a basic example, and usually it's in a more complicated circumstance, but if somebody was giving someone else a gift and at the time they gave the gift they had the expectation that that person was going to come to their house and volunteer their time to plant their flowers um the irs may construe that as you hired somebody to plant flowers for you uh, and they would not consider that a gift uh, again every 
every transaction is based on its, its own fact and circumstances. So it's hard to give a, a you know, a, a specific answer. Uh, so if the IRS uses a situation where they don't believe that there was a bona fide gift, they may characterize it as taxable income. Uh, I don't think the IRS is ever going to give strict guidance on this since every um, situation is slightly different and they will take each situation um, into consideration for what it is. Uh, the best thing to have if you are audited is records. So records that account for every dollar that went into your bank account, every dollar that went out of your uh, bank account, regardless of where it came from or where it went, even if it's later discovered that there was some sort of mistake made or the IRS thinks one of the individual transactions uh, does not meet a, uh, the level, does not rise to the level to be a gift, the other transactions will not be uh, thrown, at, uh, thrown out. So the more complete records, the, be the better you are off if the IRS does get involved. Um, the best record, the best thing to have is contemporaneously kept records not records that are made after the fact. You can recreate records um, using reasonable means, but it can affect your credibility with the IRS. Uh, original receipts, you definitely want to keep original receipts, uh, but if the IRS ever asks for them, never send the originals, always send copies. Um, and, and have some proof um, that your organization made the gifts, whether it's just a log of who you gave the gift to, or if you take, took a picture with them, you know, people do what each group is going to make up their own mind on how they want to do that. Uh, but if you have somebody contemporaneously keeping records and those records do include, you know, uh, the person who it was gifted to or the address where it was gifted to, uh, that, you know, that will help you. So just show the complete picture. If they can, if it's, if the IRS can follow the money, you won't have a problem, especially if everything was done with charitable and, and, and donor of intent. Um, um, so when you, f when you file your return, if you have a question as to whether or not you have, um, income, I would always, um, contact a certified tax professional, an enrolled agent, a CPA, um, a tax attorney, if you need to, I don't think that's probably an issue here, but as you see, this person who submitted this question has a CPA in their group and, you know, based on the limited facts we have, the C it sounds to me like the, the CPA is correct in saying that this is not reported on, on the tax return. Um, so if the uh, same thing, if you get audited, you may just want to contact somebody, even if it's a phone call to say, there's my situation. How do you think I should proceed? Um, if there is nothing criminal, then the, which is a very high standard to me to be considered doing something criminally, uh, criminal and tax, the worst place the case will end up is the United States tax court. Uh, and you have the choice to file a petition in court. So if the IRS proposes a liability and you don't want to go to court and you can just agree to it, you have to initiate the court case with the tax court. So that's up to you. Um, and if you do, that's a civil court that handles tax matters between the IRS and taxpayers. Um, and that's, I represent, most of the time I'm representing uh, low income taxpayers at no charge uh, before the United States tax court. Um, and then if you do go to court and the judge um, agrees with the IRS and not your arguments, you're just gonna have to pay whatever the proposed taxes were. Um, but that that's kind of the basic background on, um, on what is characterized as a gift and what doesn't need to re be reported because it's excluded uh, from income based on the fact that it's a gift. Um, we can move on to the next question. Thank you, Robert. Okay, so what do I do when I get a 1099K? Uh, okay, so as we discussed, you know, as, as was discussed earlier, a 1099K is a reporting form that uh, these third party um, the third party processors have to report to the IR, uh, IRS if there's $20,000 or 200 transactions uh, in a given year. Um, if the money is a gift, you have two options. Um, you don't report the money on your tax return, 
uh, because you say it's a gift, but the IRS knows you received the 1099K, so they may inquire as to why you did not report it. Um, and the second option is to report the income as um, what's called other income. It's currently on line eight of schedule one of the form 1040. Um, and then reduce it as a non-taxable gift. However, if you do that, you need to provide an explanation with a return. And that's where somebody uh, like a enrolled agent or a um, CPA comes in handy because they know how to do it properly um, and limit your, your risk of getting audited. Um, that has to be done a certain way so the IRS computers know that there's uh, an explanation uh, as to why you reduce the, uh, the income that's considered other income from the IRS. Um, either way, it can end up in an audit by the IRS. And then we're back to what we talked about previously with making sure that you have um, proper records and um, keep track of everything. And so I think that's it from me for now. Thanks so much, Robert. All right, I think the next question that Hope is gonna put up is one that I'm asking Mike. Um, okay, so distributing funds to undocumented or criminalized communities. How many specifics about cash gifts recipients are expected on tax exempt applications? And what is the risk of providing this information if your fund focuses on a criminalized community. We have a lot of undocumented migrant workers we provide mutual aid for, and it's been difficult for us to get our money from our fiscal sponsor without providing W-9 forms. What's the best method possible so that others don't have to take on the tax burden? What are issues that could come up by distributing money to undocumented communities. Is that different if we are distributing money as individuals versus through a 501c3 or other legal entity? Let me unmute myself. So uh, thanks for these questions. These are things that I've given some thought to in working with undocumented folks doing mutual aid. Um, we also got a question um, online today about uh, a group of uh, sex workers or mutual aid for sex workers that um, were having trouble um, banking because of um, Patriot Act restrictions. That's something that I haven't yet thought in detail about, but um, there are questions around cash transactions um, in so certain forms of entities like co-ops. That um, is an important issue to, to think through and I haven't done so yet, but I, I hope to soon. So for groups that are working specifically with, with undocumented folks or other people who want to keep their information private, a lot is going to hinge on the type of bank account and the type of organization it is. If you're unincorporated, um, chances are that you don't need to give documents about those people, about people you're giving money to, to anyone. Um, especially if you're under the 1099K threshold, there's a lot of, um, there, there's not really a place where you would even list that information. The challenge for undocumented groups are for 501c3 groups. Groups that are 501c3 seem like they have to comply with this certain set of rules on disaster relief or emergency hardship funds. And those require, um, there's a three-part test. I don't think for interest of time, I'm gonna get into the details, but prong one is it has to be a proper charitable class. Prong two is, I mean, it's, it's 
totally the criticism of charities. It has to be the worthy poor, right? They need to, they have to meet the objective needy or dis, needy or distressed test. Um, and third, there are pretty significant long-term record keeping requirements. And um, undocumented groups that I've worked with have real concerns about those record keeping requirements. And um, I think that it is uh, a real risk to do um, work if you are holding yourself out as working with undocumented folks and working mostly exclusively with undocumented folks, um, I think there's a risk of complying with the 501c3 laws here. The IRS does have a good record of not sharing information with people, but um, you know, if you're saying we have a, a, a list of people who are undocumented and we are keeping accurate records of it, and um, it's a long list and we're giving them money, like, uh, you know, I'm not gonna tell people that seems safe to me because it doesn't. <laughs> so, um, so that's a reason to not do this, you know, not do this work with a 501c3. However, if your group is really serving lots of different people, and it, it, it's a group that includes undocumented folks, but also lots of other people. Um, I don't see how the IRS or anybody else could realistically look at a thousand names and just like say, oh, we're going to invest all, we're going to investigate all 1,000 people here because maybe some of these names might be, you know, undocumented folks. That doesn't make, that doesn't seem like a, a way that the IRS would spend its time or that anybody else would spend its time. So um, I think it's really, a big risk for, for groups that want to be 501c3 that hold themselves out as sort of specifically serving undocumented communities. But if it's sort of a general purpose fund and you have some members who are undocumented, I think it's, you know, reasonably safe. Check. Thank you. Um, here's our next question, again, from our list of questions we got before the session. Our mutual aid group is considering filing taxes as a 501c4. What are some of the implications on the work from, tax, from different tax filing options? What is easiest in terms of labor? How can we protect the identities of mutual aid recipients from the state? What are the downsides of operating as a 501c4? So the 501c4 is, um, you know, there's, there is flexibility there compared to a 501c3. And I think there is greater privacy for um, people you give money to as far as the requirements on record keeping. Uh, to take a step back, you know, the general differences between a 501c3 and a 501c4, um, 501c4s don't have restrictions or as many restrictions, I should say, on um, political activities and lobbying. And uh, 501c3s provide the benefit of uh, tax deductibility for donors. So if you have a rich person who's going to give you money and they itemize their taxes, then, you know, they get this tax benefit. Um, potentially 501c3s are also better eligible to get grants. As a general matter, 501c4s are um, what lots of regular kind of progressive as well as like, you know, right wing groups use for their activities, you know, a lot of activities of, you know, big green groups are done through 501c4s, a lot of activities through big human rights groups are done through 501c4s, a lot of activities of like the NRA are done through 501c4s. They're pretty flexible um, and have, you know, provide you with a lot of uh, room 
to to do a lot of a lot of what you might be wanting to do. Thanks so much, Mike. All right, let's look at the next question. What are some things to keep in mind in terms of taxes and handling money when starting and maintaining a bail fund? What do we need to know to keep money moving through a rotating fund? How can you make sure you are not taxed on money you raise through Venmo and Cash App which were then used to bail people out of jail or put people, sorry, put money on commissary of people inside prisons and jails. Is it possible to run a bail fund without a fiscal sponsor? So bail funds are so important and, uh, you know, we keep people in cages in this country for, you know, long periods of time for nothing and um bail funds are you know a great tool that we have to um to help our communities probably because of that they're also really complicated to set up <laughs> um what i usually recommend to people who want to who are thinking about setting up bail funds uh there's um, an organization called the National Bail Fund Network. Uh, I recommend talking with them. Um, they have some good resources and can help you get started on the right footing. We got a bunch of questions about this in the questions that were sent in to us ahead of time for this for this thing. Um, and uh, if there's five or six or seven mutual aid groups out there that are all talking about doing bail funds in your respective states, um, you know, I'm, you know, I want to talk about it. I want to think about how we can make it happen because it's, it's, you know, critical stuff. So, um, you know, it does, it is complicated because a lot hinges on state law, a lot hinges on, you know, banking law. Um, so it's, it's a little complicated, but it's, it's, it's critical and it's worth, thinking through how to do it right, because um, there's such a need for it. Thanks, Mike. Here's the next question. For funds that support both mutual aid and direct action, can you address issues we need to consider in terms of bank accounts, tax consequences, and transparency of fund use? If our organization primarily focuses on pushing for change in local government, but we want to receive donations to support shorter term initiatives for mutual aid when the government isn't moving quickly enough, do we need to be a nonprofit? So these are sort of the, you know, opposite sides of, of a similar question. In my opinion, um, you know, mutual aid isn't just buying groceries. You know, maybe we should be doing that too, but uh, direct action is, um, you know, a piece of this same project, a piece of the same movement. Um, and, you know, if you're in a group that wants to push for local government change, that's cool, you should be doing that too. Uh, so the answer is, yeah, we should do it. The legal questions are, you know, the legal questions. So as, as far as the tax implications of those activities, you know, a lot depends on exactly what is being spent and how. For instance, if you're paying people to organize, that might be a salary, it might be an independent contractor, sort of, um, you know, and, and that could be putting you into the need into the category of needing to do a 1099 MISC form. Uh, if you're going on the internet to ask people to give your to give you money to help you organize, advocate for changes to laws, or advocate for direct action, that doesn't sound like it would necessarily meet the gift standard. And so we then have you know the possibility that that would be taxable income. You might want to separate these projects 
if you're doing a lot of mutual aid and it's all gift, and then you have a smaller piece of um, activity, or at least as far as funded activity that is doing um, direct action, maybe you don't combine those pools of money and we keep them separate. You know, a ton, a ton of it's going to rest on the details of what your group is doing. It might be, um, you know, having two projects is a good way of proceeding and they can be like in communication, right? Just because they have two separate projects doesn't mean they can't, you know, collaborate and coordinate and work together. They can and, and probably should. As far as the question of whether you need a nonprofit, um, if you're pushing for change in your local government, depends on the details you know if you're paying an organizer if you are a group you know that's one thing if you're paying a group of if you're just like a group of local concerned citizens you know you can be a, a community association that advocates for things in your local town hall without having a nonprofit or for having tax exemption that's the way things have been kind of traditionally done um if you're thinking about hiring staff and doing a full-blown advocacy program you know that does start to sound like a like a 501c3 or a 501c4, but um, you know it's going to depend a little bit on the details. Thanks, Mike. Um, Hope and I were just separately chatting about how we're running a little bit behind, but we also want to make sure there's time at the end for some live Q and A based on the questions that are coming in while we're in this event. So if it's okay with you, Mike, we're going to um, keep doing these important questions that came in ahead, but save from 7.55 to 8.10 to just do um, some of the live um, questions, um, some of the questions that came in. Great, okay, so I'll, I'll read this question. We'll go back to these for a little bit longer. Can we become a legal entity now in 2021? and then file our 2020 taxes as that kind of entity. Can we stay amorphous, not a legal entity, even though we took in hundreds of thousands of dollars of donations? What are the legal liabilities that come with staying amorphous? So I do think that if, you know, your money is mostly in the form of gifts, if your money is mostly meeting that gift standard, uh, you are probably in okay shape. You can't do what you're proposing to do here, which is like if you took in a bunch of money in 2020 and then say, oh, we're gonna incorporate and become a nonprofit in 2021 and try to backdate it, probably can't do that. The exception there is, um, if the founders of your group, you know, signed some documents that was arguably an organizing document in the terms of the IRS, um, maybe you could make the case to the IRS that your intent was to incorporate and you just didn't meet the technical requirements. Um, I think that that's an interesting argument to try to make um, because I'm a nerd, but uh, but it's not um, it's not something that would be a standard approach. I think that it does you know potentially meet the, the language of the of the internal revenue code but it's it would be very out of the box thanks all right next question maybe we're just doing it as this smaller flag okay what are some issues related to taxes and handling money when creating a brick and mortar space yeah so um the last three questions here um, I asked to, to have included because the, they're questions that are like particularly close to, to my heart and I thought would be a good way to um, wind down our, our pre-planned questions. Um, to my mind, there's nothing to compete with having a brick and mortar space for building community and organizing. Um, you know, having a physical place to gather is, um, huge and a huge way to build community, a huge way to make connections across different movements and across different communities. Um, and I think it is just, you know, of vital importance to um, to doing organizing. And I'd love to see mutually groups that are um, getting into, you know, br the brick and mortar world. 
Um, you know, I think that uh, the first, you know, one thing that you might want to think about is like, realistically, if you are going into a brick and mortar space, um, having a corporate entity might be something you need to do, might be something you need to do. Um, if you're going to be signing a commercial lease with a big landlord of some sort, um, they're probably not going to sign it with uh, an individual. Certainly not if you're in like a big built up city. Um, it could it could work if you were working, you know, with friends or acquaintances or somebody has an extra space in their in their home or something like that. Sure. I would also turn to um, the universe of awesome physical spaces that have existed um, and sort of the activist left for some time, you know, uh, Red Emma's, uh, ABC No Rio, um, you know, in New York, May Day, um, Bronx Social Center in New York, uh, every state, every, you know, many towns in your state may have these kinds of places and um, they're places that are, you know, like I said, close to my heart. And I think um, an important thing to uh, build bridges to and, and those groups are, are, you know, political allies, political friends and groups that we can talk to about um, how to create um, spaces in our towns and our neighborhoods to um, to do mutual aid from. Thanks, Mike. Um, someone asked this very general question: Can we discuss recommendations and best practices for non-hierarchical groups? I just want to share a couple resources um, that might be useful. Um, so something I spent a lot of time working with groups to do is to figure out how to make decisions together um, in non-hierarchical ways, how to bring new people in and have them get really active, how to deal with conflict that comes up between people in groups. Um, and this is both with groups that have like some amount of staff or somebody's getting paid and groups that have no staff and are all volunteer, which most mutual aid groups are, but it varies. Um, and there's a couple of resources I just want to direct people to where I've posted information about lots of different parts of those questions. Um, so I think someone's putting them in the YouTube chat for me now. One is this website, Big Door Brigade, which has a mutual aid toolbox, toolkit type thing. And inside that toolkit is a section on forming and sustaining groups. Um, and it has a lot of other people's thoughts and ideas and mine. And then also this link to a post I did inside my website of lots of different tools I've written about these questions, like how groups form um, uh, internal culture um, that is horizontal and can deal with all the complex power dynamics and differences that come up for us, even when we're trying to practice um, shared you know, consensus-based leadership, um, how we rethink what the qualities of leadership are, um, moving out of the white supremacist capitalist patriarchal culture norms and towards a different set of ideas about what leadership can look like um, how we make sure people who are doing work get to get feedback on that work and get better at it instead of just like getting told they're doing a bad job later all of these many tools so um, i'm just offering those two resources and also the second half of my new book about mutual aid is like about these questions in a general way and has some specific tools and i'll turn it over to mike for thoughts that he wants to add yeah so those are those are great resources um and uh i would say um for groups that are thinking about um how you can do this in a nonprofit context i have i should i will do i will be as um good as dean and find a link to um to my piece and put that in here and have that be put in the chat as well. But um, for groups that are thinking about how to make more horizontal uh, groups within the context of a nonprofit, um, I think a lot of the answer to this question is really group dependent. Um, you know, doing this with six people versus 60 people is very different. Doing this um, in a you know, doing work that is, you know, maybe high risk and low risk is very different. Doing this in a way where you really need to bring in money is different than doing it in a way where you may not need to bring in money. 
Um, there's a lot of different factors in play. Um, long term, I hope to uh, to work on expanding my thoughts on this issue. But uh, but yeah, um, I think that uh, Dean's work is 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 great on this topic. Thanks, Mike. Um, okay, the last of our questions, our pre-planned questions. How can a mutual aid project be as anti-state, subversive, revolutionary, and anti-property as possible without getting legally and financially torn down? Before Mike takes this on, which this is a huge, interesting question, I just want to say something I said at the beginning again, which is that it's about assessing and managing risks, not take, not refusing to take risks. And so I think I'm hoping that the advice that Mike and Robert have provided during this session give people a sense of like what stuff the government really keeps track of and what it doesn't keep track of as much and what, you know, figuring out what's essential to do to not step in this problem or in that problem and also figuring out how to skirt the edge. I mean, these are, it's complicated and unpredictable to some degree, but it's worth finding out as much as we can um, from people who know about how these rules are enforced. I think also sometimes people choose to take risks that might mean that they have some trouble with the IRS and that, can also be legitimate. I mean, we there's whole histories of left movements in which people have been underground and dealt with all kinds of heat from the government. And it's really complicated to figure out when or if people want to do that, what's worth it. But I just want to like remind us all of that range of anti-authoritarian activity. And a lot of, you know, rich people have lawyers who help them get away with all kinds of stuff. And <laughs> Most other people don't, and that's not right. And so I think it's this complex question: Is it? Do we have the capacity, or can we deal with these rules enough so that it doesn't become a hiccup in our work? Or do we want to thwart the rules because we're doing something urgently right now, and we are going to risk the possible consequences? These are just like these questions aren't really like legal questions. They're kind of just like questions for a group with best guesses about. Um, consequences that people like Mike can help us try to assess. I think ultimately we don't believe in the current systems. In preparing for this workshop, I was astounded the deeper I thought about it, about how much the government and the nonprofit as status, tax status, all of this is put up in a way to prevent us from doing mutual aid and to force us to share with each other only through the charity model. Like that really feels like how it's designed. And so it makes sense that we are frustrated and angry about that. And the question is just like with everything else we're dealing with, like how are we gonna um, navigate what is true now so we can make something else, the conditions that we're living in? Just a few general thoughts. Mike, please take it. Um, that was a great answer. A hard a hard act to follow as Dean often is. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, you know, I think that um, it's it's on the one hand, I you know, I want to encourage people to like take the actions that they want to take and then figure out the consequences later. Um, obviously, there are times when when you know you need to assess risk before you go into anything, and I do like the um, analogy of like you wouldn't plan a big direct action without thinking about you know when the cops may interfere or when when um you know when there might be uh, a need to break off from the direct action and 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 do something else and i think that you know that's a you know kind of analogous to taxes in some ways right it's kind of analogous to nonprofits in some ways right like the state has all these different tools that they use and some of them are you know cops with guns and some of them are you know, 100 page long statutes with with 500 page long regulations that go along with them that, you know, you need uh, uh, somebody to to sit down and have the time to do it. And most people don't have that ability or that time. Um, and it's, um, you know, it's, it's intended as as a tool to to stand in the way of, you know, acting on your impulses, and acting in a way that, um, you know, you believe in your heart is right. 
And so, um, you know, I think this question is like, you know, this is the goal, right? That's the goal. And so, um, you know, I think that to me, whether you're staying amorphous as somebody or whether you're staying unincorporated and you're trying to stay on the DL, um, or whether you're like, you know what, we're going to go ahead and become a 501c3 or a 501c4 and grow our project as big as it can and maybe get grants and whatever. Like, I think if you're staying as true as you can to your principles and um, not letting some of the, you know, the real uh, pressure from the nonprofit form to get you to be more hierarchical, to get you to, you know, live off of grants and to only, you know, rely on uh, professional managers. Um, you know, it's possible to do to do take either approach and to do really good work and to really make a change. And I think that um, I try not to draw bright lines like there are groups that are like, we comply a little and there are groups that are like, we totally comply. And the way we comply is by having this like convoluted structure that um, is protecting us as best as it can because we have four different entities that we can put some money into our this entity and some money into that entity and to balance our risk in different ways. Um, but it is, um, you know, I, I think that that this question is something that every group is going to have to try to decide for themselves. But it's, you know, it's the question that's the ultimate question. That's why I thought it was a good one for the last question here. Yeah, I just want to add to that. We so much more frequently get wrecked by our own conflict about money than we do by the IRS or the government coming after us. Not that that doesn't happen, but so the the handout that Mike and I made that maybe someone can put the link in the chat again, that handout has a set of questions about like that groups can think about, about how we're choosing to handle money. And the biggest one I've seen is just, is there more than one person keeping an eye on it? Can more than one person access it? So that nobody can just take it all because sometimes we have crises in our lives and people are struggling and sometimes somebody takes all the money from the group. And um, so that if somebody becomes unavailable to the group, we, we can't no longer access the money we raised. But there's a lot of other questions on that handout that I'd recommend groups think about for themselves that are less about the legal structures and more just about like thinking ahead, which for good reason, people in mutual aid groups are responding to crisis and we often don't kind of set stuff up super intentionally. It's never too late to, to go back and have those conversations and try to sort out how we wanna keep going. There's some really great questions that people have sent in. I wanna share a couple of them with you, Mike, and you can let us know if you want Robert to come back into or if you can do these, but they are all related to 1099s, so I'm gonna read them together. The first one is, can we hear more about what to do if you get a 1099K? If we don't report it proactively, how big of a risk is that? Do we just wait to see if we get audited? Um, and then also, what if Venmo or PayPal doesn't send us a 1099K? Um, if we haven't gotten one yet from Venmo and PayPal, does that mean we're not gonna get one even though our group had more than $20,000 um, move through? Um, and then the last one on this is, does your fiscal sponsor ever issue you a 1099? We've gotten tax documents from our fiscal sponsor. Is that right? Or should we be pushing back on it? Um, well, I'm happy to answer. Robert, do you want to, do you want to take a first crack at some of the 1099K forms or should I? Um, I'll answer a couple of things. So uh, <laughs> if, um, First one was about uh, so if you if you receive the 1099k uh, and you don't report it, there's a chance that the IRS is going to inquire about why it was not reported. Uh, depending on the amount of income they think you have um, compared to the other income on your tax return, that may affect the amount of time they have to open an audit. So normally they'd ha you'd have if you reported everything on your tax return, normally it's three years. Um, if there's a substantial amount of tax left off the tax return, they can audit somebody for six years. So if you report it and then reduce it and give a proper proper explanation as to why you reduce that income, you, you'd be in a better position of limiting the risk uh, for audit uh, to a, a shorter period of time. Um, 
if you received a um, if you did not receive a 1099, it's possible you still may get one, but it's, it's they should have been sent out by now because um, they usually do the last week in uh, January. Um, technically, that doesn't matter as to whether it's income or not. Um, and if you believe it's not income anyway, then it, it shouldn't make a difference. Because um, technically speaking, you, you a reporting form doesn't necessarily mean you have income or you don't have income. But if you think everything that was um, everything that went through your Venmo was a gift, then it, you have nothing to worry about. Mike, do you want to add anything? No, that was great. That was great. Um, there was one question about having a fiscal sponsor. A fiscal sponsor issuing you a 1099 I don't know um, if it was a 1099-K form. Um, I, um, I'm not sure of the answer to that. Um, I think I would absolutely ask for an explanation if you got something from your fiscal sponsor that you weren't, that you weren't expecting or weren't, weren't sure about. Um, you know, it, one of the things that's confusing about fiscal sponsorships is that it's a term that's kind of made up and it's not like there's a law about fiscal sponsors, fiscal sponsorships. It's just a contract. And so there's a fiscal sponsorship contract between your groups and they can kind of look like anything. Like you could call what you could call, you know, anything a fiscal sponsorship contract. And so the specifics of your relationship are going to be defined in that contract. Um, so it's possible that in that contract, um, that that might have been, you know, one of the terms of that specific contract. But, uh, you know, I would I would ask questions. Absolutely. I mean, you should have if you're working with a fiscal sponsor, they should be transparent about what their processes are and, um, you know, how they came to you know decide to give you this tax form for what reasons. Thanks. I think we'll just do one more question from the live questions. Um, what if people are giving to a Patreon, for example, and receive a reward like stickers or t-shirts for a certain donation level, um, like raffles or donation-based fundraising events like bake sales? Can a donation to a mutual aid group still be considered a gift if the group offers something like stickers as a thank you? Do you want to do it, Robert? Yeah, go ahead. OK. so. Um, if what is being given is really nominal, if you're talking about a sticker that is worth 25 cents, um, I feel okay about it. If it's something that has a value, and I think it would depend on the amount of the donation versus the amount of the thing given in return. If you get a t-shirt for a $100,000 gift, um, that's, not a, that's not a transaction. If you get a t-shirt for a $20 donation, well, that starts to look like a sale. Um, and so, you know, if it's really something that's that's truly nominal, I would not worry about it. If it's something that has a real value, then um, you're going to have to take the you know the total gift and reduce that piece of it as as income. So let's say that somebody gives you a hundred dollars and you give them a T-shirt that's worth fifteen dollars or twenty dollars. Um, that might be eighty dollars of gift, but then it's fifteen or twenty dollars of um, of a transaction of a, of a of a you know business transaction, and that would be regular income. Okay, there is one more question I really want to ask because it's come up from several people, which is whether either of you would share any thoughts about five hundred one c eight. Ooh, I'll talk about five hundred one c eight. Uh, fraternal organizations. Um, yeah, 501 C8s are, uh, are cool. They're, um, they're complicated um, and you need, um, it, it has to operate in what is called the lodge system, which means you, you have to have multiple entities to form a 501 C8. It's really like a type of tax exemption that was created for, um, you know, like the VFW or the Girl Scouts or something like that, where there's a 
central organization and then lots of um, lodges, lots of lots of individual branches of that central tax exempt organization. Um, you could imagine, um, for instance, a version of like DSA or a group like that being a 501c8 where there's a centralized, uh, they're, they're not as far as I know, but you could imagine like a centralized organization that is tax exempted and all these little local projects and local organizations that are um, part of that overall project. Um, it's an interesting model and I think it's something that um, people have been flirting with in activist spaces for a couple of years now. Um, but, uh, I, you know, I'd like to hear if there's if there's folks who've been using it out there um, who've had success, I'd, I'd love to hear more about it because it is um, it is cool, it is interesting, but it's, it's, you know, maybe not something that I've seen put into place in a, in a lot of places. Thanks so much. I think I'm gonna move towards wrapping us up. I have a few little things to say to remind us here at the end. So one is I just wanna remind people of that handout that Mike and I made um, that's on the event page in case that's useful to bring back to your groups to discuss and the resources that are there. I wanna remind people of Mike's legal guide for mutual aid groups. It's got a lot of the common questions people might be asking it's also listed in the resources. And I want to remind you to email bcrw at barnard.edu. If you want to send Mike questions we didn't get to, and he might be um, writing up answers to some of those and posting them so as a way to keep this conversation going. And you can also send an email to that email address if you want to be added to a Slack channel where conversations like this have already been happening for the last year and where we can continue to have more of them. And I'm hoping that we're gonna continue this series and put on some other kind of mutual aid nuts and bolts type sessions, potentially about things like decision-making together and establishing um, group culture that works for the group. So please stay tuned and thank you all so much for all the incredible, moving, beautiful work you are doing to help us all survive. And thank you so much to the ASL interpreters, the captioner, Robert, Mike, Pope, Eve, and all the people who worked on organizing this event.